Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Main, and thank you very much for having me uh, here. I, I do apologize that Lauren's not here. Uh, we, um, we tend to um, uh, tag team these things because Lauren has a background in health policy and politics as a Democrat, and I do as a Republican, so I'll try to be, as they say on Fox News today, fair and balanced, but <laughs> you'll let me know uh, if otherwise. So the first thing I need to do is figure out how to advance these slides. There we go. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about some of the specifics of um, ASE's priorities in Washington and the broader health policy context. Um, before I do that, I thought what would be helpful today, as Lauren and I were talking about the presentation, would be to try to give you at least a little bit of a broader context, um, not just, you know, here's what ha what's happening in Senate Bill 1234 or House Bill 6789, but um, why does Washington seem so crazy these days? Um, now, I know some of you are going to say just President Trump, but that, that's not all of it, so a little more than that. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that, and, and I, I basically um, have a a theory, let's see if I can advance this. Um, one second, let me just get a little, you give me a little instruction. The little arrow key here. Oh, there we go, there got it, okay, just, use that. just forward, okay. So, um, so we're in a, we're in a world of, of great change in Washington, and I wanna show a little data that talks about that change, because again, um, it affects uh, the broader policy climate, political climate, clearly, but also directly affects our issues and how we go about it and in terms of our uh, priorities. And, and my, my theory, as, as Lauren and I have kind of stepped back and looked at what's happening uh, in, in our political system, is that it's really part of a broader dynamic. And, and I, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but this is the way that I've started to think more and more about the world in terms of things that make sense. Number one, we're at a time of huge demographic change, huge shifts in demographics. Number two, are the economics of the world and the U.S. are changing very, very dramatically too. And on top of that, you've got sort of the, the rocket fuel of a rapid rise in technology that's, that's moving much more quickly than it ever has at any point. And the result of that is that we are having huge changes and disruptions in our political system, and I think increasingly in our policy climate. So last time we talked last year, um, Republicans controlled the House and the Senate and uh, obviously the White House, um, but we had another what they call kind of change election in Washington where you have one party that takes over the House in a big wave, and in fact, uh, we've got a whole bunch of new uh, Democrats who now became the majority in the uh, in the House, but for, the f for only the second time in history, you also had a really interesting phenomenon, which was the Democrats won 40 plus seats in the House uh, to take over the majority, but the Republicans, the opposite party, actually won a couple of seats in, in the Senate. Uh, and so why is all that going on? Well, it, it, it is this kind of upheaval and this change. One really interesting point, and I said that, that part of my theory is that the, the political system and the disruption and the changes in society and our political system more broadly are affecting policy issues. And I'll just give you one fact relative to health care. So when you look at this Congress in the House of Representatives, only one-third of the 435 members were there when the Affordable Care Act passed. Um, less than half the United States Senate. So when we go talk to people about Medicare issues or Medicare reform issues, a lot of these members are, are new. There's almost 100 new members uh, in, the Senate, in the House and 10 new in the Senate. So uh, again, I want to talk about health policy in a little bit of this broader context. So you see it. Um, I was talking earlier with one of your colleagues about the the tremendous advances uh, in, in ECHO around technology and clinical care, but we see it across the globe in terms of changes, and I want to talk about how it's affecting our politics. So in the, in the 10 elections between 1960 and 1978, three of those elections where the circles are were what we call those change elections. The presidency changes, the House changes, big flip, okay? Next uh, couple of decades, 10 elections, four. Okay, pretty stable, okay? Now here's the decade between 2000. 2000 was the election where George W. Bush became president uh, by a five to four vote of the Supreme Court. And uh, starting with the last two decades, guess what? Almost every election that we face has been a change election. So we're sort of whipsawed between uh, both parties. 
And it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. This is happening across the globe. Uh, we've seen it in, in, in Europe and South America uh, and, and on every continent. Um, so how do we get here? Again, I'm going to talk for a minute about things that don't have to do with health care policy, but as a way to think about health policy. So how do we get here? Why are we in this sort of whipsaw of, of all this change? People frustrated that they vote in the Democrats, and they don't quite do what you want to do, and then they throw them out, and they put in the Republicans, and they have the opposite thing. Well, a couple things. Number one, uh, we don't trust gatekeepers anymore. Our institutions, uh, we used to sort of you know, cling to and trust and, and look to for guidance. Other than the military, small business, and the police, everyone else is kind of going south, uh, including the media, uh, religion, uh, public schools, uh, organized labor, all of these folks that in the 60s and 70s we used to look to uh, to, uh, to give us guideposts. In, in the 1970s, early 1970s, the most trusted person in America was Walter Cronkite. Okay? That was back when the news would inform us, and now we watch either Fox News or MSNBC or CNN not to inform us as much as affirm our views. Um, but like, look at what's happening with Congress. Now that's even lower. Uh, the, the late John McCain used to say that with 9% approval ratings, the only people who support Congress were paid staff and blood relatives. Okay, so, um, but you know what? The medical establishment, uh, again, some of this are things like the opioid crisis and, and greater transparency. Today, we had a uh, presidential executive order on greater transparency in health care. So as the world's changing, demanding greater transparency, demanding greater openness, um, attitudes are shifting. So it, it, this is a question that was asked by Gallup, um, and, and you can see where the trust factor has eroded over the last several decades. The other part is we don't feel included anymore. Uh, the people who are winning is continuing to get smaller. So look at the top 1% share of household incomes from 1975 to 2015. Went from 8% to 22%. The top 100 firms' share of earnings went from about half to 84%. And the CEO to worker pay uh, it, uh, dynamic went from 25 uh, to 1 to 272 to 1. So th this is just one picture. I'm sure you see it, but I talked about the economic changes. But people are really feeling this as a, as a pocketbook issue, uh, and that to me is, is another uh, factor. Um, and then here's another point I, I mentioned, the pace of technology. This is the time it took technology to reach 100 million users worldwide. So the telephone took about 75 years, uh, the internet uh, just under 20. Uh, but if you look at Candy Crush down in the bottom, less than a year. You know, so uh, that is a, a visual, but you see this in medical practice. So as a result of this, this is what's happening a little bit in our politics, again, in a, in a broader context, but it's affecting health policy, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute here too. Um, but for some people, and you could kind of characterize these as voters on the on the right, uh, let's say, or the Trump voters, although it may be a little bit simplistic. Um, but change, all that change that I just talked about is moving way too fast, right? So you get the reaction of Brexit. Uh, you get the reaction of the, the yellow jackets, the loss of dignity and the, the, the transparency around taxes being more than half of the price of a gallon of gasoline in, in, uh, in, in France. Uh, and, and you get folks for both on economic and social dynamics feel like the world is moving way too fast for them. And then you have others who feel like, and again you could characterize these maybe as the progressives or the uh, folks on the left, for change is moving way too slow. And for those uh, you see the, the, the push by a lot of those in the, in the Democratic Party here to make college more affordable, universal health care, uh, Black Lives Matters, and, 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 uh, uh, and Me Too, and all of those things, again, enabled by technology, but sort of thrust forward by, I think, these broader changes in our society and our economics. Okay, so with that as a quick background, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, health care. And, and here's Donald Trump. I call him the disruptor in chief. Um, and uh, he clearly is having a disruptive impact. Now, when I use the word, by the way, disruption, I don't mean it as totally negative. Um, you know, we, we, I wasn't uh, at ASE five years ago, but I, I guarantee you if I would have been in Portland, I would have gotten here either uh, by the train or by a, a taxi cab. Uh, today, I just pulled out my, you know, my trusty iPhone, and I called a Lyft, and uh, so disruptive technology is, is happening, and disruption's happening in healthcare, too. I, I talked about these change elections, but I went back and looked at some of the major pieces of legislation. I, when I first started working in Congress in the early 1990s, and 
1996, we passed the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and I looked at the majority party in each of these cases. The majority party, Republicans, uh, in 96, um, there were two Democrats that voted against it in the House and zero Democrats that voted against that bill in the minority party in the Senate. You fast forward to the Medicare Modernization Act. That was the bill that gave us uh, prescription drugs for seniors in 2003. You had 16 Democrats, which is a pretty large number, who voted for that in the, in the Senate. I mean, in the, in the House in 11, which is an even bigger percentage in the, in the Senate. And then you look at the more partisan votes as we get to the Affordable Care Act. Zero Republicans voted for it. You look at the repeal and the replace effort. Zero uh, Democrats voted for it. And this is, to me, why these change elections matter and why it's important for stakeholders to be engaged uh, and why it's important for us to go up there. Not only are all these members new, um, we talked about the huge changes, and we've got to continue to educate them around uh, our concerns about uh, affordability and access um, and accreditation and appropriate reimbursement. Um, but because things are changing so quickly, remember, less than two years ago, we were one vote away, John McCain, from repealing the Affordable Care Act. And if you look ahead and the Democrats sweep the next election, we could be very close again to not only repealing it, but maybe having Medicare for all. Or if Republicans win, we could be back here. So these elections matter. Uh, this was down to one vote. Um, and when you look at some of it, the, the other factor that's happening in Washington, as you can see, is sort of this extreme partisanship. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit earlier. I'm trying to do my best. Um, but I mean, we're so partisan that Lauren didn't even want to stay here this year with me. Um, no, in all seriousness, she really did go back because they're, they're voting on a bill tomorrow in the, in the Senate Help Committee, and we felt it would be better to have one of us there, and obviously she's the one who's the most competent. But, uh, uh, but, but look at this. This is sort of amazing. This is the support or opposition for the Affordable Care Act by party, and I created this graph because it was fascinating to me that, that Democratic support for what they call Obamacare, Republican opposition, is exactly identical. The support in the opposition is identical. And when you look at the longer term trajectory of where the parties are going, um, big picture wise on coverage issues, they couldn't be more different. Democrats, you've heard uh, a lot of talk in the election of the sort of different flavors of Medicare for all or Medicare buy-in. Republicans, when they were going to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, I had that slide earlier, their alternative was to basically take all the subsidies bundle them up, send them down to the states, and let the states figure out how to spend them with a cap. So I, I call that block grants for all. The Democrats, uh, longer term, want to look to build on and expand Medicaid. Uh, Republicans are looking at ways to provide waivers and limit it with things like Medicaid work requirements. Democrats want to keep Medicare as it is and, in fact, build on it. Republicans, if they had their druthers, have talked for a long time about privatizing it or moving to more of a premium support system where only private plans compete. And when you look at the world of um, insurance market, uh, Republicans are looking for much more flexibility. And in fact, I think one of the main reasons is all the pollsters show that Democrats won the last election, had a lot to do, or almost everything to do with health care. Um, so here's a lesson uh, for all you reformers. It's never a good uh, platform for your party to say that you want to radically change the health care system and take away what people have. I think Republicans just found that out by losing over 40 seats in the House by trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I think Democrats found that out a few years ago when they passed uh, the Affordable Care Act in the first place and then lost 63 votes in the House because the President said if you like what you have you can keep it. And so this is a, an area that's sort of uh, fraught. But uh, here's some good news, uh, which is despite all that division, um, bipartisanship is still possible. Um, and these are bills, if you would go back three Congresses, and I'm not going to go into the details on these, but when, when there really is a crisis and when we really kind of look to find areas uh, where people are in agreement and we have to on our issues, um, there were two major bills that passed to provide new authorities and new funding for, uh, to combat the opioid crisis. There was a major change in federal law to improve access to care and Medicare for the chronically ill, uh, the Chronic Care Act, the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, which over time has become a much more bipartisan program, was reauthorized uh, in 2018, last year for 10 years, which was the longest period when the law was reauthorized for um, major changes around 
uh, 21st century cures to speed, uh, or at least try to speed things like interoperability and greater cures, and MACRA, uh, the Medicare Access and CHIP reauthorization, which obviously has a huge impact and is one of the things we're, we're working on here. Um, so that, with all that as kind of background, again, sort of this extreme partisanship, but still areas where folks are coming together. And by the way, um, I see some of you taking pictures, but I, I think all these slides are available on the website, and I'm happy to email them to anyone who wants them. Um, but here's some of the key agenda items that Congress is, is working on, and then I want to talk for just a minute about uh, what the administration's working on, and then some of our priorities, and then I'll, um, uh, and then I'll conclude. Um, but, but on a couple of these things, you'll see where the parties are, are completely divided, uh, and on a couple of things, you'll see uh, where they're actually uh, coming together. By the, by the way, one, one quick note on partisanship. I found this other data point uh, interesting. There's all kinds of data points if you look at it, but um, back in uh, the late 60s, Gallup did another poll and they asked people who were Republicans or Democrats, um, if your son or daughter were to marry somebody from the opposite party, how would you feel about that? And about 4% of Democrats said that, that that would annoy them, and about 5% of Republicans. So they did that poll again about four years ago, and 60% of Democrats, strong Democrats, and 66% of people who strongly identified as Republicans said that they would be angry if their son or daughter married somebody from the opposite party. So I found that really interesting in an era where, where everyone is feeling uh, sort of much more uh, open or progressive about, about marriage, that's the one data point that's moving in the opposite direction. So you'll see against the backdrop, healthcare sometimes plays out as uh, very, very partisan. Affordable Care Act is one area. Democrats feel like, again, as I mentioned, they won the election. And so you'll see a number of bills that are being sort of move forward by the Democratic House uh, to try to say Republicans were wrong. We're going to look at shoring up um, the, the Affordable Care Act. We're going to push back on some of the regulations that we feel the Trump administration has put forward that undermine, uh, or the Democrats' word you'll hear is kind of sabotage the Affordable Care Act. And the Republican view is, again, completely the opposite, which is this is overly regulatory. We ought to give people more choices and more flexibility. So that's going to be a flashpoint. Here, here's the bottom line. Nothing's going to happen. Um, because the president's not going to sign anything. This is mostly about sort of political positioning. Prescription drugs is probably the one area where there's actually been more activity than anywhere else. And, and, and why is it? If you step back and you we were talking about this in the uh, committee meeting yesterday, on both prescription drugs and this other issue, surprise medical billing, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, the great frustration when you, when you, when I talk to members of Congress who come back and they talk to their constituents or you look at focus groups and polls is number one, costs are growing up too fast and it's not so much premiums but out-of-pocket costs as we've all seen rising deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance and prescription drugs is one where people feel that when they go to the pharmacy uh, every month or every, you know, three months. Um, and the other issue is complexity of the healthcare system. They're just so frustrated with the insurance dynamics and everything else. So that's pushing a lot of the drive. So there's, um, I mentioned Lauren headed back to Washington this morning. Uh, the Senate Health, Education, Labor, Pensions Committee is going to mark up some major changes on uh, on prescription drugs, um, and the House is sort of following suit and holding hearings. I think something here is going to get done, but what are the issues they're delaying? They're trying to ban things like pain for delay, where uh, a branded company would actually have a negotiation with a generic competitor and pay them to sort of keep them from coming to market and competing more quickly. The CREATES Act, where there's been concern that some of the brand pharmaceutical companies in the name of safety under the REMS processes, the safety process, are holding back data that genetic competitors would need. So those are things that there's a lot of, frankly, bipartisan agreement around. Things like whether the government ought to negotiate uh, for Part D drugs, uh, the Medicare prescription drugs, as opposed to private plans doing it, much more controversial. The president's actually said he's for it, so we could see an agreement in one of those areas, but, uh, but again, uh, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of road to still uh, cover, and the administration continues to sort of implement uh, their own plan. Also things like importation of prescription drugs from Canada or Mexico or other places continue to be controversial, but we could see this administration maybe allow some states a limited waiver opportunity. They're talking actively about Florida being one of those. I mentioned surprise medical bill, and I'll move on to the last couple here quickly. That's another one that's occupying a lot of time and one that is going to be voted on in 
the Help Committee this week. This is the issue of, that's become more and more of a concern as people go, let's say, to the emergency room or they have emergency surgery, they go in, they pay their hospital deductible, and then they might get a bill from an anesthesiologist that says, well, you owe on top of your deductible three or $4,000, and Congress is really concerned about that. So the solution has been, let's take the patient out of it and hold them pardonless, and then let's the, the insurers and the physicians kind of fight it out. Um, and the bills that seem to be emerging are ones that basically say that whatever the median in-network rate is has to be accepted even if you're out of network. So the insurers and the consumers kind of like that solution. The physicians in a lot of the hospitals would have preferred more of a negotiated arbitration, but we'll see where that uh, goes, but I think that's going to move forward. MACRA uh, and Medicare, uh, we're, we're very engaged in with ASE here because um, the American Medical Association and others have been supporters of MACRA as an alternative um, to the old SGR system. We're in a situation now where there are five or six years of no updates and we're trying to work with Congress to make some changes um, because all the information that we're getting back from our expert advisor says that the cost of practicing medicine, as you know, is going up by, on average, about 2.5%, but MACRA is not keeping pace with that. So I think will be some changes at the end of the year. And Medicaid will be one of those areas where uh, there will continue to be some fights, but there also are some bipartisan bills. We supported uh, something called the ACE Kids Act, the Advancing Care for Exceptional Kids, that actually passed and was signed into law by the president this year. That established more flexibility in Medicaid to treat comprehensive um, uh, uh, conditions and, and chronic conditions through coordinated care. So again, some of this, as I said, is really partisan. Some of it's uh, not partisan. I talked already a little bit about what the administration's doing, but I think whatever we see Congress doing, you're still going to see this administration aggressively kind of promote things that they can do within their own regulatory power. I won't go into great detail. There may be some time for questions here at the end, but, but um, the biggest one is prescription drugs, um, but also they, as said, had a big um, news conference today where they announced a new executive order on transparency where they're going to basically try to require um, uh, all health insurers to kind of disclose and providers to disclose this is actually the negotiated price of your care. This is what consumers can get. Um, so looking ahead, uh, I talked about surprise billing. I talked about macro implementation and some of the uh, changes that we're trying to get. Uh, I, let me just mention a couple quick things and then I'll, and I'll finish. I, I, I think I talked enough about surprise billing, but on macro implementation, uh, we think there's a lot of bipartisan support for the law. I think we've sent the message along with a lot of our other physician colleagues in Washington that we'd like to see some changes. I think there's receptivity to it, and they have to pass what they call a Medicare extender bill, where they extend a lot of expiring provisions at the end of the year. I think that'll be a place we'll probably see some of these changes, um, but some of them are costly. In other words, things like providing a positive update. So we'll see, because when you're getting into budget issues, it's always a little uh, hairy, but, but we're working hard. I think there's some good receptivity. There was a hearing just a couple weeks ago on this in the Senate. Site neutrality is one where we're very much uh, on guard. Uh, we continue to have reports from the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. The administration continues to be very interested in site neutrality, and um, uh, this would be really, really, I think, a devastating change to a lot of uh, folks here if we actually paid a lower rate, uh, basically the, the, the outpatient rate for folks who were treated in an inpatient setting. And then again, Medicare extenders, is, I think, is where a lot of these uh, issues will play out at the end of the year that we're focused on. So I think with that, um, I will stop. I'll give you back a few minutes. Hopefully with that, we'll have some time uh, at the end for all of us for Q&A. Um, but just conclude by, by saying I hope that, number one, my talk at the beginning a little bit about the broader context of our politics and the change and the importance of staying engaged uh, as a nonpartisan institution that cares about uh, our patients is really critical against this backdrop. And, and number two, uh, just to say I really uh, continue to be honored every day to represent um, you all in Washington. So with that, Dr. Main, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Dean, and that was great.